Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be here with you today. My biggest regret is that I chose this water bottle and I just spilled all over my pants. So don't look here. Look here, okay? Look here. Look there. Uh, it's so great to be with you. I always love coming to spend time with you guys. It's such a treat to be here. And this is actually the first time that my family and I have been worshiping together in person in a church since the start of COVID. So not saying you guys are special, but you guys are pretty special. Uh, and in fact, you're so special that I uh, decided to write a brand new sermon for you. This is brand, I know, it's a miracle. It's a brand new sermon, and which is good and bad, right? I mean, you guys in some ways are the guinea pigs. So if this doesn't go well, no one will ever hear the sermon again. Uh, but hopefully it goes well. And in fact, I got so excited writing this sermon that I just kept writing and writing and writing. And it got longer and longer and longer. And then I, I timed it on Friday. And I was like, I better just check. And uh, so anyway, I'm not even going to tell you how long it was, but we could do two sermons. It could be a series. And so, I know, all of a sudden everyone's like, it got really quiet in here. Uh, so I, I talked to Pastor Nicole. I said, hey, Nicole, like, it's really long. Like, what should I do? And she said, oh, she's so nice, right? She's like, oh, don't worry. It'll be fine. People have preached long sermons before. And Pastor Brian's sermons always seem really long anyway. And I couldn't believe she said that. Like, I was really surprised that she said that. But I was like, Nicole, you shouldn't say that. She's like, I did not say that. I know, you didn't say that. That's okay. And a joke, Brian and I love each other. We spend, we spend time together every week praying. And I appreciate you, Brian. We even, we even start to dress alike. We spend so much time together. So, um, so anyway, I was, like, I was like, what should I do? So then I talked to my wife, Julia, a very wise woman. I said, Julia, it's, it's kind of long. And do you know what she said? She said, nobody likes a long sermon. So uh, she's like, cut it. So I cut, 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 cut. It's still a little bit longer than I think I'd like it to be, but uh, it's just jammed full of goodness. So I'm sure you guys aren't even going to notice. That's right. That's right. Amen. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you. No. Anyway, um, plus people, I think people are, most people are at home anyway. They're just like so, you know, pull that little lazy boy thing and, you know, get comfortable back home. Um... Before we jump in, there's a sermon handout. Hopefully you saw it on the little table uh, on the way in. If not, you can kind of sneak your way over there, socially distance-wise, and uh, get one. Uh, I forgot to ask what happens if people are home. at home. Is it available if they're at home? Yeah. It, it's in the scripture box. Description box, yes. It's in the box, in the description box on the website. So that would be, there's, I'm going to throw a lot of stuff at you, so you might want to like, write some stuff down. And if you are joining us online today, I really want to encourage you to be uh, interactive with us. I'm very interactive, as you know. I'm interactive, aren't I? Yes. yes, that's right. So we have conversations here. So if you're online, type, be really chatty in that online chat. Feel free to throw some emojis in if you don't know what to say, especially those laughy emojis that all the good jokes and even the bad jokes. Throw some emojis in there. And I just want to say a huge word of thanks for all of your support for our campus ministry. You know, this church and people in it are some of the biggest supporters of our campus ministry, and we appreciate you so much. You are a gift to us, and we are just so blessed by you. And friends, we are having an amazing ministry year. Now, it's a lot different than we planned, but we are having an amazing year nonetheless. God is transforming the lives of so many students as we live out our, our mission to be an incredible community where people experience Jesus and his transformation. And uh, our ministry looks a little different on, on each campus. I think there's a slide. Is there a slide somewhere that shows our campuses? There. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that one works. So as you can see, we, uh, we do a lot of huddle groups, right? Do you see that? Uh, and huddle groups are these discipleship groups that we have where students are really going deep in discipleship. And some of those dis uh, huddle groups are called discovery groups where students are discovering Jesus for the very first time. And those are extra specially exciting, as you can imagine. And you want to hear a really cool story? About four weeks ago, we started a brand new one at St. Lawrence College. Brand new discovery group. We got some students together, and at the very first meeting, two students gave their life to Christ. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Only God can do that kind of stuff. Uh, so we, lot of, we see a lot of transformation in our huddles, right? And we also do a lot of great groups. Let's show them that, uh, that slide again, if we could, the, 
that big what we do slide. There it is. You can see we do lots of stuff. I'm not going to go through everything, but uh, we do a lot of, a lot of groups, a lot of one-to-one discipleship. Um, we even do an occasional baptism. See that in the bottom left there? We're doing a baptism. That was in September, and uh, that's kind of how we started off the year. And I thought, man, we started the year off with a splash. That's just to whet your appetite for more. Uh, Anyway, uh, you can see we do a lot of we do a lot of stuff. We do international ministry. We do uh, we teach courses. We develop a whole online mission, and we even try to equip churches. You see, we want to learn all we can about this next generation, so that we can help. Well, we so that we can understand how to help them get connected with God and His mission, right? And we figure, well, we shouldn't keep that to ourselves. So we want to share all that we are learning with the local church as well. Because we believe that God's kingdom is built better when we build it together. Don't you? Yeah. So God is doing so much. If you want to learn more, you can go to genevahouse.ca. There's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff on there. And I just want to thank you for all of your support and your partnership in us and our mission to reach young adults. Well, you know, I absolutely love discipling young adults. And I find it so rewarding to invest in this next generation. And I find them so fascinating, don't you? There's so much that we are learning about young adults, and in particular, this age group that we call Gen Z. Has anyone heard of Gen Z before? Put up your hands. Yeah, a few people. Let's let's do a little generational overview just to get us all on the same page. So this is where we're going to get interactive. So... Uh, If you were born, there we are, if you were born between 1946 and 1960, what are you? You're a baby boomer, right? If you were born between 61 and 80, what are you? Oh, it's gone. Can we put that screen back on? (laughs) You have no idea. There it is. We'll just keep that up for a second. You are? Gen X, right? You guys heard Gen X before? You're looking at one right here. Gen X. I don't look anything like that guy, I don't think. Um, if you are born between 81 and 95, you are Gen Y, otherwise known as a millennial. You guys have heard of millennials, right? They're that age group we love to hate on. If you are born 95 to 2010, you are, come on, Curtis, be with me here a little bit more. Gen Z, that's right, Gen Z. And does anyone know what comes next after Gen Z? Like, is this the end? Is there a generation after Gen Z? Anyone know? They, well, they reset the clock and they called it Gen Alpha. Genius, right? Yeah, genius. So those are our generations. And most of our focus right now at Geneva House is on the upper part of Gen Z, this 18 to 25-year-old age group. And there are so many things to learn about this age group because there are so many things going on inside of them. Young adults are in a time of tremendous change, right? They are in physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual flux. There's so many big things going on in each one of them. For example, did you know that our brain, like the human brain, doesn't even fully develop until we are 25 years old. Did you know that? It's true. I read it on the internet. Check out this chart that I found. This is pretty legit. This is Business Insider. It's actually all over the internet. So check out this chart. This is the age your brain matures at everything. Look at that. It shows, uh, you know, everything kind of culminates at 25, right? So by age five, you know, our brain is advanced enough to start mastering language. Age nine is when uh, our brain is tuned in to playing a musical instrument. Thank you very much. And 25 is a big year, right? When our brain has fully developed and we add on the capacity to what? To control our impulses, right? And to acknowledge peer pressure, right? Now, that doesn't mean that 25-year-olds will do this very well, but at least they have the capacity to do it, right? And this finding may explain a whole bunch of crazy things, like why university students host massive house parties during the height of COVID. 
Has anyone seen this about Western here? Anyone see that before? And Queens just shakes its head at Western. Queens would never do this type of thing. <laughs> you know, whenever I see young adults doing these mind-blowing things, I'm always like, what in the world? And my wife, Julia, she's so wise. She's always like, remember, their brain has not fully developed yet. Now, being mature and being at our peak is actually different. And so there's some good news. We, as we get older, we can gain new abilities. So we're not over the hill when we're over 25. So here's a follow-up chart where it tells about what our brain peaks at. Right? This is our, when our brain peaks. And so there's a lot of good stuff here. If you're a teenager and you're having a hard time focusing, that's okay. Just wait till you're 43. You'll, you'll get there one day. And all the 43-year-olds said, what, 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 where am I? Uh, the chart goes all the way to age 67. And when you're 67, you can gain new abilities and you can learn all the the slang words that the cool kids are throwing around, right? Like, don't be a Karen. Right? Ever heard of that one? Or, or for those Among Us fans, any Among Us fans? He's so sus. Or, that's so basic. Or, try this one. I'm mad salty right now, though, low-key. Big yikes, no cap. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to look that one up later. Talk to a Gen Z. But there's so much going on inside of a young adult, right? And they're at such an important time of their development. And they're wrestling with so many questions, especially questions about their identity. Do you know what one of the biggest questions that young adults wrestle with? Who am I? Who am I? It's a massive, massive question that includes so many different aspects, like how am I different from my parents and my siblings? Or, or like, what am I good at? How am I going to contribute to the world? Or what do I believe in? All these wonderings are part of the bigger question, who am I? Well, this morning, I'd like to take a look at a really great passage in the Bible that also raises this question, who am I? And the passage is John 1, verses 19 through 28. And it's a story about John the Baptist. Now, John was a prophet who was born just before Jesus, and his job was to prepare people for Jesus' ministry. So he was the warm-up act. He got people ready to meet the Messiah. And he was called John the Baptist because he called the Israelites to return to God. And as a sign of their commitment, they were baptized in water. And when it came to drawing a crowd, you could say his ministry was a slam dunk. I'm just showering you with baptism jokes today. Oh, you didn't like that one? All right, let's move on. I don't want to create any waves. I think it's not going well. If you're watching online, it's not going well here. It is not going on. Well, at the time of our passage, John the Baptist was super popular, right? He was trending, and he was what you might call a social influencer. If they had Instagram back then, he would have had way more followers than the religious leaders of the day, and those leaders did not like that very much. And so they came to him with some questions about who he thought he was. And I think it's a fascinating passage that we can learn a lot from. So let's take a look and see what happened. And before we jump in, I'd just like to offer a prayer. Holy Spirit, as you spoke so long ago, speak to us today. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear you. We need to hear you, Spirit. We are surrounded by so many voices, but we only want to hear one voice today. We want to hear your voice. And so please speak to our very souls as we reflect on your word and transform us, we pray, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Okay, well, let's read this passage together, shall we? It's going to be on the screen here, I think. I hope, hey, look at that. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. 
He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? Now, the prophet was this prophet that Mosea, I mean Moses, Moses said would come at the time of the Messiah, right? And so John the Baptist said, nope, not him. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. And this all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now, as we read this, did you get the feeling that John had a strong sense of his identity? He knew who he was, he knew who he wasn't, and he knew with absolute clarity what his calling in life was. You know, there are so many young adults that would love to have that clarity about their calling and their identity. You know, I've had many conversations with students who are just wrestling with who they are and and what they're called to do, what they're supposed to do with their life. And, you know, I remember struggling with the same thing when I was 22 years old and I just finished university. Since high school, I felt a strong calling to be a pastor. And so off I went to university where I majored in fun. I know, some of you were there with me. You can, yeah, I know, I'm getting waves. Anyway, we had a lot of fun. I spent a lot of time developing my relationship skills, but not nearly enough time doing schoolwork, especially Greek. Anyone here ever taken Greek before? Yes, 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 exactly. Why would you? Um, Anyway, let me tell you, studying Greek was quite the odyssey for me. That's a a kind of high-level pun for those of you who know that. Anyway, thank you, Rob. Um, And my Greek marks were no great achievement. You could even say I put the reek in Greek. That's true. You know, the good news is I passed everything, and I was totally happy with that. But the bad news was that Greek, good Greek marks were apparently important to the seminary I applied to. So to me, a D meant done. <laughs> to them, a D meant don't bother applying. And it's true. Do you know what happened? I got a rejection letter in the mail, and I was totally devastated. It was a massive rejection that made me question my identity, my calling, and even my sense of self-worth. It was a very deflating and difficult experience. And I don't have time to tell you the whole story of what happened next, but the short version is, after a lot of prayer, and after a lot of reflection and wrestling with God, I went back to school, I retook Greek, and, and one of God's greatest miracles, since he turned water into wine, he turned my D's into A's. I was accepted into seminary and became a minister, and here I am today. Thank you. I brought my, my diploma along just in case some of you want to check my credentials later. Now, God used that experience to teach me many things, including how important it is to work hard for him, but also that I need to find my worth in God and not in what I do. That crisis really helped shape my identity. And it's kind of funny that I had to go through all that because now one of the big parts of my job is to help students work through their identity and to understand their calling in life. Yeah. Have you ever noticed that God uses the things that we go through to help other people? Has anyone ever noticed that? Do this with your eyes, because I can't see what your your face is saying. Yes, give me a holy head nod. 
Well, I think we can learn some really valuable insights about our identity from something that John the Baptist went through. But first, here's a big disclaimer. These insights are in no way a shortcut for any young adult who's on their journey of maturity. The reality is we must all walk the road of becoming an adult. It's a really important journey where God shapes us and trains us and matures us. There are no shortcuts on the road to adulthood. I had to go through what I went through to become who I am today, and you'll have to go through what you go through to become who God wants you to be. That's just how the process works. So don't expect any like, big shortcuts, like, oh, it's going to tell me what my calling in life is, right? That's not going to happen. But I think our passage does have some, does have some important insights for all of us with regards to our identity. And the good news is these insights will apply to all of us, whether we're 9, 19, or 90. So let's look more deeply at this big question, who am I, this identity question. And you know, I thought it would be fun to get a, some students' perspective on this question. So I asked, uh, I asked six students on campus, and I said, hey, I'm going to ask you this question. Who are you? And I want to see how you're going to respond. So we created this short little video, and let's see what they said, okay? My name is Emily. Who am I? I am a soon-to-be nurse once I've passed my exam this month. I am a fun, outgoing person. I'm down to do just about anything. I love spending time with my friends, family, housemates. Um, in my spare time, you can find me at the gym, playing sports, trying to study, or looking at places to travel to once I have money to travel and once COVID's over. Hi, my name is Ben Lammers, and I'm a son, a brother, a fiance, a friend, and a student. Uh, I enjoy spending time with family and friends, but I also value time alone to uh, read, write code, and play video games. Um, and in all of these things, I'm a follower of Christ, which guides how I live every day. Hello, my name is Sandra. I am a third year student at Queen's University. I'm in Global Development Studies and Geography. Um, when asked the question about who am I, I think I would best describe myself as an intuitive and compassionate individual. Although I am very much um, an introverted and more soft-spoken person, uh, I think I'm pretty fired up about social and environmental justice issues and change. Um, I'm also very big on adventure and trying new things, whether that be like experiences or food. And I love the idea of living life to the fullest. Hi, my name is Lauren Sun and uh... I'm a student here at Queens. I'm a lifelong Leafs fan, but I think most importantly above all, I'm a devoted follower of Jesus and a new creation because of his amazing gift of salvation. Hi, I'm Luke, and I'm a child of Christ, redeemed by Jesus, and that's my identity. Hi everyone, my name is Samara Collier and I am here in Kingston studying life sciences at Queen's University. Who am I? I am a daughter, I am a sister, I am a friend, I am a leader, I'm a student, and I'm also a sales and service representative. But above and in all those things, I am firstly a daughter of God who is constantly being humbled and encouraged by his radical love and grace. Weren't those great responses? Yeah. <laughs> Except for that Leafs comment. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. I, I know we all love Leafs here. <clears throat> How did John the Baptist answer this question, who are you? Well, verse 23 says, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. Now, John was quoting Isaiah 40, verse 3, which was a prophecy in the Old Testament that a messenger would come to prepare the way for the Messiah. You see, Israel was longing for this great Savior. They were an oppressed people who yearned for someone to deliver them from the many troubles they were in, including Roman occupation, religious emptiness, and a massive identity crisis. 
You see, Israel was God's chosen people, right? They knew they were God's chosen people. And, and so they had this status about them. And there was a time in the Old Testament when they were a pretty big deal. They had power, they had privilege, they had position, and their life was really good. They had it all until they lost it all because they rejected God. They walked away and God let them go. And let me tell you something, when God lets you walk away, things are never going to go well for you. And they didn't go well for Israel. Israel got themselves into a whole mess of trouble and things went wrong on so many levels. They were conquered by one nation after another. And by the time John the Baptist came around, God's chosen people, the special ones, had been ruled by other nations for about 600 years. And God not only let them get into trouble, he stopped talking to them. There was no prophet, no voice of God for about 400 years. Has anyone ever given you the silent treatment? Just put your hand up a little bit like that. Now, maybe it happened this morning on the way into church. We've all had those rough Sunday mornings, drive into church, right? We know, we know the silent treatment's like. Well, has anyone ever given you the silent treatment for 400 years? <laughs> it seems like it. But Israel wasn't just having a bad day. They were having a bad six centuries. Everything was a mess, and their world was just falling apart. Their society had no soul. Their religion had no relationship, and their hearts had no hope. The people of Israel were in a spiritually dry place. They were in a spiritual wilderness. And when John the Baptist appeared and started showing them how to get reconnected with the living God, people lined up like shoppers in a pandemic waiting to buy toilet paper from Costco because they were desperate for a voice in the wilderness that would lead them to an encounter with a living God that would change their life forever. I think our world's a, a little bit like the world of Israel back then. In many ways, our society is in a spiritual wilderness. And there's a spiritual battle going on for the soul of this generation. The question isn't if Gen Z is being discipled. The question is, who's discipling them? And they're not the only ones, even us older folk. We are all constantly being discipled by what we watch, by what we listen to, by how we spend our time, by what we're exposed to. And I was thinking, who are the disciples in our world today? And you could probably come up with a list, but as I thought about who are some of the big disciplers, I thought about YouTube, right? or Netflix, TikTok, Facebook, the news. The news is discipling us. Even politicians are discipling us. Our friends, we could, we could add lists and, and names to this. We're, we're all being discipled by many people constantly. And I think a really important question to ask ourselves is, who is discipling me? Who is discipling me? Who's influencing my thinking and my beliefs? Who am I modeling my life after? Who am I letting shape me? You know, every generation is shaped by what and who they are exposed to. And I think our generation needs to be exposed to some more John the Baptist, don't you? I think we need some more voices in the wilderness that point people to Jesus. We need some messengers of hope that help people get connected with God. There are so many people all around us who are in all sorts of wildernesses and they desperately need an encounter with the Savior. A recent study of university students asked them, What's your biggest challenge right now? What's your biggest challenge right now? This is very recent. I think this is like September, I think this came out. So this is like this, this semester. What's your biggest challenge? Do you want to know what they said? Number one answer by a landslide, and you can see it there. Stress, anxiety, 
and loneliness. Our students are stressed, they're anxious, and they're lonely. And I don't think they're the only ones. Our world is overwhelmed and oppressed. What if there was a voice that could help? What if there was a voice that could provide hope? What if there was a voice that could lead people to the one who could actually save us? Well, here's a little good news. There is a voice that can do just that. And if you're a follower of Christ, that voice is yours. Christ followers are modern-day John the Baptists. They are God's messengers, His voice calling in the wilderness. God wants everybody to know that He can help. He wants to save us from whatever mess that we're in. He wants to free us from whatever is enslaving us. He wants to deliver us from whatever wilderness that we are lost in. And this is not the time to be silent. Our world cannot afford to wait another minute to hear God's voice. Will anyone give me an amen? Yeah. So here's a few questions. How can you be God's voice to the people and the places around you? What messages do you need to send to help people get connected with Jesus? If we're a follower of Christ, we are God's messengers that help people meet the Messiah. That's who we are and such a big part of our identity. But who are we not? You know, I love how clear John the Baptist is in our text about who he is, but also about who he's not. But did you catch it? In verse 20, it says that when the religious leaders asked him who he was, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, hey, I'm not the Messiah. See, people were desperately waiting for a Savior, and John looked pretty good to them. I think, I think if John ran for president, there would be no debate He would have won that election by a landslide. There would have been no recount. He wouldn't wouldn't need to be Biden his time. Thank you. They get it. Even the below below 12 crowd gets it. And no one would trump him. That's right. That's right. See, John was filled with God's presence and he was filled with God's power and it led to great popularity. Temptation comes with great popularity. But John knew who he was, and he knew who he wasn't. He knew he wasn't the Messiah. In verse 26 to 27, he says, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. I just love the humility John exudes, don't you? Now, he just like figuratively places himself at Jesus' feet and he says, I'm not even worthy to be the Savior's servant. And one of the big goals at Geneva House is, one of our big goals is to develop leaders. That's one of our key strategies. We want to develop leaders. And so we invest in students and we train them and then they go out and become leaders in all sorts of really, really important fields like education or engineering or economics or medicine, military, even ministry. We love raising up kingdom leaders. And in all of our research in the area of leadership development, both the Christian and non-Christian fields, in all of our research, no matter what the context from business to brain surgery Do you know what one of the most important leadership qualities is? Integrity Integrity is good. Humility. It's humility. Over and over and over again, it's established. Humility is one of the key leadership qualities. Humility is not thinking too highly of yourself. It's also not thinking too little of yourself. Humility is seeing yourself the way God sees you. 
Humility means that we know we have limits. We know we are not God. We point people to God. We know that we don't save anyone. We show them the one who does. And we are not who other people say we are. We are who God says we are. Do you ever struggle with defining yourself based on what other people say about you? Have you ever faced this massive rejection and it just made you feel like you weren't good enough? Do you ever feel the weight of expectations that other people place on you? We are not who other people say we are. We are who God says we are. The Bible is full of incredible passages that tell us who we are in God's eyes. And if you want a big list, I included a link on your handout. It's well worth the read. Spend some time today just looking through those and meditating on those things. Wherever you're at with God today, whether you're feeling close or you're far from Him, if you're on a spiritual high or you're in a spiritual wilderness, here are some things that you might need to know. And I'll just pick three from the list. You are a child of God. You are loved. You are never alone. Let that sink in for a minute. You are a child of God. You are loved. You are never alone. Isn't that incredible? And if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, you can add this to the list. You are forgiven. You are set apart. You are God's messenger. You point people to Jesus. Do you see yourself the way God sees you? You're a pretty big deal to him. You know, he created you and you are special to him. You are not on this earth by accident. God intentionally designed you and he delights in you. He has so much to teach you about who he is and about who you are and about what his plans are for your life. And he wants to give you a life that's full of his presence and full of his purpose. What do you need to believe about yourself to claim the identity that God has for you? There are many big questions on the road to adulthood. And one of the biggest is, who am I? I think the best way to start to answer that question is by putting Jesus firmly in the center of our lives. You know, Jesus came to earth to show us the way. He gave up his life to make a way. And he is the only one who can lead the way out of any wilderness that we are in. If we root our identity in Christ, if we listen to his voice above all others, eventually everything will straighten out. And no matter what the question or no matter what the situation we face in life, we can know God is with us, he is for us, and we are who he says we are. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we humble ourselves before you. We fall at your feet. Who are we that you, the God of the universe, would be for us? Who are we, God, that the king of the world would die for us? We are humbled and we are thankful and we pray, Jesus, be our Savior. Save us, deliver us, and use us to be your voice to draw people to you. We claim your love and we claim your freedom and we claim the identity that you give us. We do this in your powerful name, Jesus, and everyone said, amen.